So we're going to give this just another couple of minutes. Um, go ahead and find your breath. Allow your awareness to follow that breath in and drop down below the mind and to encounter somewhat of a stillness. stillness that we call within, which is really a, the vast, the great, the one stillness that we're accessing through bringing our attention to the heart, which is a portal to the one stillness. The mind still wants to participate. It still wants to assess what's happening, talk about it, uh, narrate the experience. And that's okay. The opportunity isn't to necessarily empty the mind of thoughts because then our meditation turns into a struggle, <laughs> into a struggle. So it's not to empty the mind of thoughts, but to simply recognize that all thoughts are empty. They're simply of the mind. The mind is just making stuff up. It's not tapped in the truth or reality, it's just constantly reprojecting its story. So don't worry if the mind has thoughts. You can feel simply just pulled back a little bit from them and witness. the mind's bubbling of thoughts. So I'll take a few moments here, just sit without any doing. Okay. Yeah, we've got Tammy and Mary here. Beautiful. Good to see you. Or know that you're here. <laughs> and we have this, this huge, there's Tammy. Hi. You can hear me apparently, so the microphone must be working. Good. Beautiful. It's such an interesting opportunity we have in this life to recognize, to awaken as the stillness, to transcend the habit of the personal identity that has been created in the mind. I really, want, <clears throat> I really wanted to speak about that today and feel into that today that I'm finding more and more a, a rich and deep faith in doing nothing. And what I mean by that is not that nothing gets done in my life or that nothing gets done in our lives when we practice doing nothing. But what that really means is that we simply practice not doing what we're typically doing.
not giving in or just going with the typical doing of the mind. The, the story of us that is constantly, constantly assessing and interpreting the movement of life, the movement of the things that happen in our lives. Our typical doing is the mind that is constantly assessing and interpreting what is happening. And so we're re-identifying constantly with a construct of self that we've made up over a lifetime that is assessing the world according to its conditioning, according to its wants, desires, fears, feeling of the constructed self that needs to be validated in certain ways, that needs love to appear in certain ways, that feels threatened by this, but not by that. And when we interrupt that doing, by practicing stillness, by practicing being in the world and, and not giving in to or uh, not having our awareness so pointed to that doing and so consumed with that doing, that when, when we can point our awareness within, we, we call it within, but again, that's just into the stillness of the heart, which is the open portal to the vast stillness of consciousness. And when we can rest and stop, that's always the, the first thing we want to do is stop. Start by stopping. And we learn to stop naming things, naming all of our experiences, interpreting them and figuring them out and doing all the work around saying, how can I think about this differently? How can I adjust my thoughts around all of this so that, so that I can create peace, so that I can create the experience of love, which are both things that don't need to be created. It is the very essence and nature of beingness itself. I was, I was listening last night to, uh, no, a couple nights ago, to David White. And I haven't listened to David White in a while. And if you don't know him, he's in a, just a remarkable Irish poet and, and life philosopher and a beautiful guide for navigating this uh, this dynamic and richly dimensional experience of being a, a, a spiritual being in a human existence. And, uh, and he doesn't come from any spiritual background. He just comes from the more contemplative uh, awareness of, of seeing deeper into life, into the rich complexity and, and dynamic of life. And I've been, over the years, my teachers, my, my guidance has come more from, from the spiritual teachers. And, and David White used to be my, my primary guide. I would sit almost every night in a bath and, and, and turn on some of my David White audio. Uh, he's got these beautiful uh, audio books and teachings that are laced with his poetry and the poetry of others. He, he's got thousands of poems in his beingness, in his, in his presence that he has memorized. And, and he just speaks about life through in a very poetic way. And, uh, and he was my guide for a long time when I was really, before I, I had a sense of myself beyond the, the personal self, that there was another spiritual beingness that I had never accessed. Before that, he was my guide to just talk about how to be more attentive 
and contemplative and, and quiet and allowing in, uh, in the navigation of this life. So I hadn't listened to him for a while and a couple of nights ago I, I thought uh, there was nothing from my, my current teachers that was feeling compelling. Uh, and I thought, uh, I wonder if David White still resonates. Probably won't, you know, that's because I, I did that. That was, you know, five years ago. <laughs> and I turned on some David, <laughs> David White and within, within 10, <laughs> 10 seconds, there was just this beautiful recognition of truth. Truth spoken in a different way and through a little bit of a different lens, but truth nonetheless. And he was offering into the, the stillness. And he reminded me that when we're in transition, when we're moving from one known, from what we're familiar with into an unfamiliar, the unfamiliar will always feel suspect. It will always be a guarded experience to some degree. There will always be an, an alertness to questioning if this new thing, whether it be a place or a person in our lives, if this new thing is trustworthy, whether it's going to benefit us, that's the ego mind, which is constantly looking for benefit to itself and threat to itself. It doesn't know its imperishability. It doesn't know the true nature of our, of our imperishability, of our divine, infinite, imperishable and unwavering. Consciousness that know that isn't doesn't have those fears because it's imperishable. It knows itself to be the vast oneness beyond all form. But the ego mind doesn't know that. So its habit is to assess everything with a guarded nature. Am I going to let it in? Is it okay? Will it benefit me? Will it harm me? So when we When we start to allow another self, when we start to allow a, a self that is not the constructed self, not the dreamed self of the mind, and the, yet the dream self of the mind is still very much present and, and typically in control forward, it's the forward self, it's the, the primary self that still has our primary sense of identification. And we start to <laughs> we start to introduce this other self. It appears as a stranger. Just feel into that for a second. That the truth of you, the truth of us, appears initially as an untrusted stranger. That is not so guarded that is not so concerned, that is free of the warning signs and the alerts and the, and the triggers that are present in the ego body. And the ego body goes, what the hell? You, who's this? You're going to let this, you're going to let this Yahoo control things? You're going to, you're going to give over to this, 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 this does not feel safe. So this is why we practice stillness and surrender within our meditations. So that we can be in a less threatening environment. So we can, you know, we're just sitting on our cushion or in our chair. And it's easier to perhaps play with letting go and saying, I don't know, this, this new stranger might be okay. might actually have something to offer. So now that I'm sitting here feeling safe and I'm not in a 
threatening situation out in the world where I'm being disparaged or uh, I'm having to present the uh, or protect the personal identity that I've created. When that's not being threatened, I can just be, I can just sit. So that's when we get to practice the letting go. And the, the beautiful inquiry is, is, and you've heard me speak about this before, but it's worth repeating because again, we repeat it to ourselves in our meditation again and again and again is the initial inquiry, the playfulness of what if I did let go? What if there was nothing here that I called self, that I've traditionally called self? What if? What if I just let it all go? all personal identification. What would that feel like? What would be there? What is being obscured by my, the noise of my story? And it'll show up as a feeling. And we often have feel that feeling and it can feel like a, a peace or a relief or a lightness or a unburdening. And, and, and the ego mind considers that to be is it just an experience. So then the mantra within that is if, if you feel it at all is, oh, that's me. I am that. And the ego mind jumps in and goes, you can't be that. That doesn't feel like it's got all these protective measures in place. You can't be that. How would that protect you? How would this, this allowing of this peaceful allowance and presence and non-reactivity. How in the world would that protect you? And it's, and it's saying how would it protect you, but we got to remember that the mind has no allegiance to you. What it's saying is how would that protect me? It says, I feel very uncomfortable with that. And the answer is, yeah, you do because you are a limited construct, this, this me that is worrying and complaining and doesn't want to let go is just an imagined me that is full of fears. So yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure this vastness does feel very uncomfortable, but it feels uncomfortable to the false me. So I want to invite a practice of nothingness. A practice of, of stillness, not just stillness of body, not just stillness of thinking, but a stillness of not doing and not doing doesn't just mean the act, action of body. It's, it's a not doing of mind. It's an interruption of the habit, the narration of the self that we're identified with, the mind self. So it's literally sitting and allowing to just sit and be without working on anything, which is initially hard because we have a moment of stillness and the mind goes, oh, awesome. What an awesome opportunity to work on some stuff. So 
you, you notice that. And then there's a, a moving away. In, in, in Nepal, they have this beautiful phrase, says, K Garne, what to do? K Garne, what to do? And it's always said with this beautiful sweeping away. So if something is arising in life that you're worrying about and you finally realize that the worrying is do you, doing you no good and it's actually creating more anxiety than the actual situation. In that moment of recognition, the, a Nepalese would say, uh, you know, what to do, what to do, let it move, it. stop, stop. Let it come, arrive, let it be, let it be. So with our own thoughts in that moment, I used that for a long time. And I think I even did it physically, where I'd be sitting and just in the state of beingness and just being in the world and not telling any stories about anything that I was seeing, just allowing a, 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 a deep stillness. And then watching the, the, the mind take advantage of that stillness to say, oh my God, here's a, this big wide open playground. I can start thinking about all sorts of stuff and noticing it and just smiling. Smiling is important. And this beautiful curiosity of just watching and going, oh my God. <laughs> Ooh, my mind is active today. All right, what to do? Not now, I think that was it. Not now, not now, just not now. And you can practice, you can have a journal next to you if you'd like, and this was helpful for a long time is I'd have a journal because if sometimes a mind can't let go of something, it's saying, look, if I let go of this, I'm gonna forget it and I don't wanna forget it. It's a good thought, it's a thing I've gotta do. It's just something of somewhat of an import to our lives. So feel free in that moment, open your eyes and take a note and jot it down and the mind will go, okay, we got that? Yeah, yeah, I got it. And it'll say, oh, good, okay, I can, I can let it go easier now. So that can be a tool. But to practice, the stillness of just being. And to, to sit in the discomfort of that. It's like asking, it's like asking a five-year-old just to sit there, you know? They're gonna get all squirrely and squirmy and ah, but there's so much to do. So, you know, we sit with our squirminess and we sit with our, we sit with that. And we allow this stranger, this new entity to show itself, the stillness to show itself, the peace to show itself, the allowance, which is our, our, is the natural essence of us. We are the allowing. Allowing is not an action of the mind, ultimately. We come to know ourselves as the, as the allowing itself. And to let that become more familiar and, and more trusted Because I promise that if we allow it, if we, if we can rest and get, become more familiar with this blossoming, this burgeoning peace, which is not peace of the mind, but ultimate, the ultimate peace. I promise it, it, it has a, there's a recognition of, oh, this is what I've been looking for. And to spend whatever, however many years it takes to rest in it so solidly that nothing else needs to be happening. That nothing else needs to be happening.
And the real trust comes when we start to recognize that not only am I completely capable of navigating this life, I'm navigating it with so much more love and so much more elegance and grace and peace because these are not the peace and the grace and the love are not the mind mimicking love and mimicking peace and mimicking grace with having better thoughts and choosing better actions but it's just the essence of that we find that this when we interrupt the classic doing, and initially we call it doing nothing, I'm in the state of just doing nothing, that it's a little bit of a paradox, because in that, it's not that nothing is happening. As a matter of fact, everything becomes so much more precious and alive and rich and dynamic because we're not placing our mental assessment upon everything, which narrows the experience. We stop the traditional doing of assessment, judgment, and creating the experience out of, out of our thoughts. We stop that. We stop that narrow doing. And initially it just feels like, well, then there's nothing happening. But after a little bit, we go, oh, it's not that nothing's happening. It's just that nothing familiar is happening. Nothing traditional is happening. The, the, tr the, the dream is not happening. And therefore it is lessening and loosening and relaxing in the awake self is burgeoning and blossoming. And in that awake self, it's not that nothing is happening. It's just that, that nothing traditionally mental or traditionally egoic is happening. And that's what I mean when I say that we can learn to give life to God. We can give life right through the heart to the vast God consciousness, to the one source. And we the, the personal self gets to be present during that dynamic, that beautiful exchange of life meeting God and God responding to life through us. And we get to have that experience. It's a whole different conversation with life. That harkens back to David White. He often speaks of, of entering into a different kind of conversation with life. So the invitation is to practice nothingness. And to watch the mind say, well, this isn't getting us anywhere. At least nowhere familiar. <laughs> and things smooth out. That's the stability. We're not on this constant roller coaster of the conditioned self meeting a world that is frightening or disturbing to that conditioning and having to go through all these, again, mental um, loop hoops we jump through to remember that, oh, wait a minute, hold on, that's just all about them and it's not about me and I can be in my peace. Those are valuable thought processes for sure, but ultimately they're not necessary. Everything stabilizes because the one who is present, who comes forward, 
is not so small. It's not the limited, fearful construct of self. It's not the self burden, burdened with all the conditioning that we're trying to work with. Everything stabilizes because the I am is stable. I am, I just am. And that I amness can just meet the world and move towards what feels more resonant for your particular soul signature. Remember, it's God, it's, it's the God consciousness, ideally being able to modulate or, or or animate itself through the personal or through the individual soul expression and every soul is tuned differently so that the one can know itself and its infinite potentiality. And that, that's what navigates life beautifully. Love moving through a particular tuning. One tuning loves gardening, another tuning loves mathematics. So that, that love will move through a, you're, you will move through the world, you will navigate toward mathematics, if that's what thrills you, or to solitude, or to being an, an activist, or to teaching children, or to painting the world. Whatever your soul is inclined and, and attuned to do will be, that's the navigation. That's the beautiful navigation of getting the personal self out of the way. And we get the personal self out of the way by practicing not engaging it. And its engagement is through constant assessment of the world relative to its self, to its story. So we practice not being that, not engaging that, to sit in a stillness and just be. And watch, just watch for however long it takes, just watch how the mind goes, okay, I can just sit here and just be with this. Oh, wow, that's beautiful, that's awesome. Oh, I like that, oh, I want more of that. And it's just right back to the constant assessment. <sighs> And I, I, I want to add on to this, that there's a, in this practice, there, there comes the experience, the ability to truly contemplate the things in our lives, the, the dynamics of our lives. And what I mean by contemplate is to rest with something, a question, where am I going to live? What vacation am I going to take? How do I want this relationship to go? What's my next career move? Typically, we're giving that question directly to the mind and we're asking our condition to self. What does it want? What does it think? And it, it doesn't have alignment to truth. It just says, well, I'll tell you what I think based on my story, right? If we give those questions, those very important questions, to only to the constructed self and say, well, what do you think? Which is, what, what do I think? What do I think about that? We're just giving it to a story and the story is saying, well, I can, I can tell you what the story thinks about it because I'm going to assess it based on how threatening or valuable or good or bad it feels to this story. So contemplation is, is not so much about thinking. The, the, the thinking part is secondary or tertiary at best. <laughs> The contemplation means, can we sit with a question and feel into the possibility? So I'm thinking about where I'm, I'm gonna take a, a couple week uh, road trip. 
and I'm really been feeling into where to go, whether I'm going to do it alone or with a friend, whether I'm going to visit people along the way. And if I just feel into the possibilities, okay, well, Southwest Colorado, I might go there. So I just feel into that. And I just allow myself to be with, I just imagine, I just bring into my imagination images of Alpine lakes, pictures I've seen of Southwest Colorado. I allow myself just to kind of float to and be with the, the place of Ure, Colorado, and Silverton. I feel into the environment, to, the, to what it looks like in that place, what it feels like. And I don't give it to my mind, I just feel it. Does it feel resonant? Does it feel juicy? Does it feel interesting? And then to, to, to the trick, if you will, is to watch when the mind goes, okay, it just wants to think about it so badly. It wants to assess it. It wants to have a strategy around it. It wants to assess whether or not, okay, good, you felt into it. Now it jumps in and says, can I have my say? Because I've got to determine whether this is good for my story of whether I'm valuable or worthy or going to be abandoned or just all the stuff it does. So to allow to be with something without needing, without rushing to figure it out. And then I know that there's another place. Well, it might be, it might be the Redwoods and I feel into that. And there's some dynamics there. It's a 14 and a half hour drive through kind of nothingness to get there, but then there's the Redwoods and I just feel into that. And it has access to the ocean. Hmm, I feel into that. And, I, and we, we learn to interrupt, to short circuit the habit of how we traditionally navigate the movement of our own lives. It's typically navigated through the personal identity. We're not giving it to our soul. We're not letting our soul rest with a feeling and feel into a resonance and then move us in that direction. So contemplation is not necessarily thinking, but it's to be with. I should look up the Latin root of contemplation. And so to live a contemplative life is to live a life of more stillness. A life where we are giving life to our soul and to the consciousness of love to be with. And as I spoke about a couple weeks ago, and then when an action needs to be taken, that's really where the mind comes more into play where we just feel into a, 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 an authentic response, our soul's authentic desires, response, what feels resonant, what feels attuned to our, our soul and to love. And then that comes to a, a, a decision, comes to a, yeah, this is what feels right. And then it just gives it to the mind, kind of like Captain Picard in Star Trek, and it just says, make it so. And the ego goes, yeah, I, mean, I don't know if I'm on board with this. It's like, yeah, well, I don't care. Because <laughs> you, you've been the source of my problems for a long time. So I really, really don't care if you're on board with this. And that's the surrender. That's the surrender. And after a while, the ego just loses its so much power, so much dominance. And it learns to be subservient. It learns to be of service to soul. Because that's what the ego mind is ideally supposed to do. It just gives us a sense of personal identity in this world, which is necessary, but not to be the true identity, the one identity, but to be in service to, to be a beautiful 
a vehicle for, the best possible vehicle we can be, to let this enlivening dance of God and soul to play out within this conscious, awakened human experience. And to let it keep unfolding for the rest of our lives. To let this stranger become so clearly, intimately known, embraced, embodied, lived, that actually the ego becomes the stranger. Like I, I can't hardly remember. I gotta really, I gotta really sit with and feel back into the anxiety and the stress that I lived with for most of my life. The deep uncertainty, the, 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 the really uh, fragmented and fractured and wounded construct of self that I thought I was, that I was identified with, that has become the stranger. So we allow ourselves in our meditations to sit with the frontier. And anytime we're sitting with a frontier of moving from what is known and familiar into the, oh, I don't know what that is, it's unfamiliar. It's always going to feel a little bit scary or uncertain. And we just get to learn to, to be with the unknown. It's a necessary component of our evolution and our growth because we're always going to be evolving into that which we do not know yet. And it's like going to a foreign country you've never been to before. And you allow the experience to keep unfolding if you've never been to, I don't know, Italy before. You don't cross the border and go, all right, I've arrived in Italy. And you don't just sit down and go, okay, I'm here. Cool, got it. No, you, you go deeper. You do go deeper into the experience and you let it and you let it be known and felt and experienced deeper and deeper and deeper. And after 10 years, maybe you realize, oh my God, this, this place keeps revealing itself to me. It's soul, it's essence, it's nature, it's nuance, it's all the things that make it Italy. So we can do that with our own soul, our own essential nature of being that is so unknown to us because we're collapsed into the story. And we start to cross a threshold, a frontier into something that initially feels quite unknown. So we take steps. We don't just run into it. We don't go running into the unknown. But we gotta let go. We gotta let go of what is known. We gotta practice stopping that and allowing this new beingness to emerge. And it has to be complete. It's, it, it's helpful when it's a complete surrender. And then the ego goes, hey, look, I'll participate with a little by little surrender, but the, you, this whole complete surrender thing, <laughs> I don't think so. But the reason it's doing that is that when we're identified with the story of self and, when, and the ego thinks that the work is to create a better story of self, what it is doing is it's saying, let me decipher, let me determine, let me discover the parts of me, the parts of my story that are disempowering and unhelpful and, and, and getting in the way. Let me discover and decipher and identify all my fear places of my story. And isn't that the letting go? I need to let go of each one of those different dynamics and aspects of the fear part of the story. And I need to keep all of my awesome parts of the story. 
And then if I do that, I will have nothing but awesome parts of my story. Done. Poof. Awesome. But then it's still a story. And, and the, the, any story is always evolving and changing and, and will not stabilize. So when, we, when the, the feeling, the initial sense of surrender is, oh, I should definitely surrender all the bullshit. I should definitely surrender all the parts that, are, that I'm recognizing are unhelpful, the, the mindset and the belief systems and the, um, the, the stories that I'm clinging to that aren't helpful. Get rid of those parts of my story. And it gets hard. It gets, those are tangled. And, and how do I make sure that separation is happening cleanly? And the ego says, I want to make sure I'm only letting go of the stuff that doesn't serve me. And I don't, don't I wouldn't want to let go of anything that actually was beneficial to me. Let that go. And maybe I'd never get it back again. And that's, that's a real feeling of threat. So it's in letting go of everything within the meditation, let go. Everything about me. Stop believing in it. And see what might be there beyond all beliefs. That was my inquiry for a long time. What if I had no beliefs? What if I just had zero beliefs about me? What if I was not creating a me in my mind at all? Would I disappear? And sitting with that little by little, it's like, wow, not only would I not disappear, there seems to be something there that's starting to appear that I've never experienced before, that's never been known before. And the analogy is, if you've ever seen uh, in person or, or images or videos of anyone uh, winnowing wheat, winnowing wheat, separating the chaff from the kernel of wheat. It's a beautiful thing. You, the, the, you see it a lot in, in, in the third world countries where they don't have big threshing machines and they'll harvest the wheat, which is the wheat kernel uh, in, uh, in, a, in a husk. And they put all the wheat kernels on a big mat and they wait for a, a, a breezy or windy day. And they start taking all the, the, the wheat and they beat the heck out of it. They just smack the hell out of it with these big paddles or threshing, different threshing uh, tools. And what they're doing is they're breaking the kernel of wheat out of the husk. And the kernel is what we want, the essence, the truth, the real wheat. And the husk is just the thing that's been covering it. So the husk has been covering the truth, the essence, the, the thing we want. And they just beat the heck out of it. And then they, they throw it up into the wind. And the husk is lighter than the kernel. It doesn't have as much substance. And they throw it all up into the wind. They don't just pick out the little kernels. They don't pick out each husk and try to throw the husk and try to throw the husk and keep the kernel and throw the husk. Oh, shit, I just threw away a kernel. No, they just throw it all up into the wind. And the wind blows the lighter, less substantial husk. And the kernel falls back to the mat. And they do it again and again and again until all that is left is the pure essential nature of wheat and all that is not the wheat has been carried away. So in each meditation, give it all up. I do not exist. Well, no, I exist. Parts of me exist. No, no, no. There's part of my story that I like. No, no, no. But I'm a good person. I don't. That's true. Well, if it's true, it's true. You don't have to have it be a, a I'm a good person generated by thought. But I'm compassionate. I, I, wanna, I don't want to let go of that. No, let go of everything. You can't let go of you. It's impossible. It's impossible. You. The sole essence of you and the, and the beautiful, dynamic, vast love of God consciousness cannot go away. Give it up. Give everything up. Give everything up. Give everything up. Stop. 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 And, and all that will remain 
is the individual or individuated perfect tuning of your precious soul, enlivened, danced by the love of God. That is a really beautiful and free and liberated way to love this life and to play. And then we get to play. We get to play with it all and make mistakes and screw up and, and have pains and griefs and regrets and all the different rich dynamics of life, but they just don't feel threatening anymore because the beingness of love and of our soul does not feel threatened. Before we wrap up, take a moment and either with eyes open or closed, I'm finding nowadays it's actually almost easier with my eyes open to see the form, to see the light, the things, and to be just slightly more interested in the beingness within which life is moving. So just take a moment. And allow yourself to feel what initially can feel like two things. There's the noise of the mind, the movement of mind, and there is the stillness behind that. And you have to move your awareness. You have to guide your awareness. Typically the awareness is captivated by the traditional thoughts, feelings, or beliefs, and then pull back and allow that awareness to become a little bit more vast and feel into a stillness. And sometimes that stillness will just show up as a little glimmer and a glimpse and, a, and just a, a fraction of a second. Find it again. We're training the mind to stop. It takes a while. It doesn't want to. It says, but what do I think about the stillness? And then go back to saying, okay, and even that thought is happening within stillness. And the mind says, what are we gonna do with the stillness? And you go back to the knowing that even that thought is happening within stillness. And the mind says, well, but, but how does the, what's, what's the value of this stillness? And that thought is happening within stillness. The stillness is awakening from a slumber. The stillness is consciousness. The nature of consciousness is stillness. It doesn't have all the same agendas of the mind, so it can be still. 
and we start to recognize we are the stillness. We are consciousness. Expressing as a human. But we are the consciousness expressed. Be slightly more interested in the stillness of the consciousness than the expression of that stillness and consciousness. And it will continue to become more stable, trusted, real, And the reason it becomes more real is because we recognize it never goes away. It's always there. The self-image, the constructed image in the mind is constantly changing. So it's not reliable. The stillness is reliable. It's always there as we learn to abide it, to allow it, to invite it. And then as it awakens, it stays awake. And you start to have the experience of moving through this dynamic world, watching the world and watching your own thoughts and watching your own mm, continuing condition of self arise and move. And you know yourself as the stillness within which all movement comes and goes. And that stillness becomes you, is you already. But it awakens. And as it awakens, it's there, accessible, awake, present, alive, living life. The stillness, the love, and the, the unique, precious tuning of our own soul, living life. That's the invitation. Good being with you too. Thank you. I just so appreciate. <laughs> Mary, Mary votes for the Redwoods. <laughs> uh, and, and Ashland's only two hours from Crescent City. I love it. Hey, that's, a, that's still a possibility I'm really feeling into all of that and how long I want to be on the road and, and playing. And it's just listening. We just learn to listen. We learn to listen to the singing of our soul. And our soul sings for certain experiences that are resonant with it. So we just get to learn how to listen to the song of our own soul. And it's like a singer. It's, there's a certain singer that has a certain way of singing, right? Nora Jones sings like Nora Jones, and she's not going to be resonant with or attracted to a punk rock band and saying, can I sing with you? <laughs> she's going to go find, you know, jazz musicians and, and different types of musicians that play music that is resonant with her natural soul essence that is that sings a particular way so we allow the song of our soul to find the music of life that is resonant that is rich that is dynamic that is that, is, that plays well with our soul and another soul loves singing punk head smashing music <laughs> song and that's just what it feels that's the best expression of itself and it feels real and right and good and whole and healthy and, and enlivening and evolutionary and so it finds that type of music. But the last thing that is going to guide us authentically is our, is our constructed story, because it's completely made up by the mind, and it's small, and it's limited, and it's got all sorts of crap going on in it, and it's not serving us. It's serving itself. It is serving itself. It has no allegiance to the soul. The soul will take care of the ego body. The ego body will not take care of the soul. 
The soul's going to take care of making sure we're fed and taken care of and, and, and living a lovely life that we want to live. It's going to take care of that. Of course it is. It's not just going to let a bunch of, you know, let us wander in all sorts of bad situations. It's going to, it's going to take care of us. It's reliable. It's reliable. Yeah, beautiful. All right. All right, Mary, I'll let you know if I come up that way. Maybe you can come down and play. Ah, much love. Much blessings. Let's all just keep being these beautiful lights out in the world and, and keep finding our authentic peace and love and so that others can bask in that presence and that aliveness and start to have whatever experience they need to have. But our, our real work is to be in service to the divine and let that be shown, let that be, be expressed in the world and let others do their dance, whether they're fully in their dream and fully in their story or gently awakening or wherever they are, that's their dance. And the most authentic thing we can do is show up and be on true to divine love and the radiant, beautiful tuning of our own soul. All right, much love. You know, brought me much happiness today. Thank you. All right. Um, ne I think next Sunday again. I think so. Yeah, I'll still be in town. I won't be in the Redwoods yet. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>